Okay, today we're going to <clears throat> look at uh, different people in psychology for a review for your AP test. So looking at individuals before the formal field of psychology began, we start with uh, two Greek philosophers who were the first on record to write about why people act the way they do. Uh, Plato, he was a nativist, so his contribution is the fact that he believes that people act the way they do uh, because it's in your genes, so it's your nature. Um, Aristotle came along and he argued that. He believed that it's our nurturing, um, our experiences that shape how we act. So he was referred to as an empiricist. Um, the next two people would have been in the Renaissance time period, Descartes and Locke. Uh, Descartes was French and he agreed with Plato. He was a nativist believing that ideas are inborn. And John Locke agreed with Aristotle. He was an empiricist and he believed that experiences will shape our behavior. And uh, he even said that the mind is a blank slate and each experience can change us. So basically, um, these four men started the whole nature nurture debate. So Charles Darwin, he becomes a big factor in the nature nurture controversy. Um, he wrote the book, Origin of the Species, in 1859. His idea of um, survival of the fittest um, will lead to uh, evolutionary, the branch of evolutionary psychology. Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, he's the one who actually came up with the term nature versus nurture. Um, he was a nativist, so he believed that intelligence is something that you inherit. So the first actual psychologist, Wilhelm Wundt, had the first psych lab in Germany, 1879, Leipzig, Germany. Uh, sometimes he's referred to as the father of psychology. He was a structuralist, looking at the different structures of the mind. He and his um, assistant, Titchener, came up with introspection, and that is where you record your own thoughts and feelings, like in a journal. Um, next, we see William James. He was an American psychologist who worked at Harvard. He was a functionalist. He looked at the functions of the different parts of the mind. He wrote the first psych text, Principles of Psychology. Um, his assistant wanted to be his student at Harvard, Mary Calkins, and went through the program but was denied her PhD because she was a female. Um, she did become the first female president of the American Psychological Association in 1905. Next, we see G. Stanley Hall. He had the first American psych laboratory, and he became the first male president of the American Psychological Association. And <clears throat> next, we see Sigmund Freud. Um, he appears in the 1900s. He started out as um, a physician but eventually became a psychiatrist. And he came up with psychoanalysis, which you know very well by now, um, believes that unconscious thoughts and childhood experiences shape our behavior. And they use free association and dream analysis to uncover those unconscious thoughts. So up until the 1920s, psychology pretty much consisted of unconscious thoughts and not really looking at behavior. That changes when John Watson appears and he says, why are we focused on 
you know, someone's thought process. People lie. We should be looking at observable behavior. So he is the founder of behaviorism or the father of behaviorism. And his assistant was Rosalie Rayner. And if you recall from the learning chapter, uh, they are the ones who did the baby Albert experiment uh, at Johns Hopkins. So next we see Ivan Pavlov and he did the classical conditioning experiment um, and received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. So he is a behaviorist as well. We have Skinner. Skinner is an American psychologist who uh, elaborated on Thorndike's law of effect, the fact that if you reward someone, the behavior will increase or strengthen. If you punish them, it will stop. So he elaborated on that idea and came up with operant conditioning. You are two humanists, Rogers and Maslow. Uh, they promote self-awareness, um, try to improve your self-esteem and your self-image. Uh, next, we see Francis Cecil Sumner. He was the first black male to get their PhD in psychology in 1920. And here, two women pioneers in psychology. First, Margaret Washburn on the left, first white female to get her PhD in psychology in 1931. Uh, to the right, Inez Prosser, the first black female to get her PhD in psychology in 1933. All right, so this is a picture of Franz Gall, and he was the first to try to make a connection between uh, the brain and our behavior. Uh, he used a technique he called phrenology, studying different patterns of bumps on the skull and trying to connect them to certain uh, personality traits. Of course, we know that doesn't exist, but it's the first attempt before uh, modern tests to try and make that connection. So um, here's two important men that we see involved with language. Um, aphasia, aphasia is any type of impairment to our language. And uh, the Broca's area was an area in the left hemisphere in the frontal lobe that was discovered by a man named Paul Broca. Um, he was a physician working with stroke victims and he recognized when that area of the brain was damaged, uh, we lost our ability to speak. So that area controls the muscles in the mouth. Um, the Wernicke area, um, also in the left temporal lobe, uh, Carl Wernicke identified this was an area of the brain that it, if it was damaged in stroke victims, they couldn't understand what others were saying. So in other words, you could hear them and you could speak, but when someone talked to you, it sounded like they were speaking in a foreign language that you'd never heard before. So Paul Broca and Carl Wernicke. One of the most well-known developmental psychologists is a Swiss psychologist named Jean Piaget. He identified that children think very differently at different stages throughout their life. We're going to focus on his three-step learning model and also his four stages of cognitive development. All right, when we looked at developmental psychologists, we talked about Jean Piaget. Um, he studied a lot of children extensively, testing them, his own children and thousands of others, to try and figure out how children think differently at different ages. So he came up with uh, the four stages of cognitive development. Um, first stage, sensory motor. Children learn through their senses, so, you know, taking in things uh, that they hear, things they see, touch, taste, and smell. And they also start to move around. So that's why it's called the sensory motor. Object permanence is the mental milestone here. So, at around nine to 10 months of age, children develop object per permanence, recognizing that things exist when you're out of sight. 
So before that, you can drop your child off at uh, babysitters or daycare, and once you leave, they don't cry because they forget about you as soon as you walk out the door. Once they develop that object permanence, then they get uh, separation anxiety and they get upset. Um, the pre-operational stage, that is the preschool children who lack logical reasoning, so they never question what you tell them. They believe Santa Claus is real and the Easter Bunny and uh, the characters on TV. Um, the mental milestone here is to lose their egocentrism. Children up until age three or four, everything that they see and hear and think, they think you're thinking that as well. Um, that should stop around the age of four. Um, if it persists uh, into elementary school years and they cannot develop theory of mind, being able to put themselves in your place, uh, that could be a sign of autism. Uh, the third stage, cognitive operational. These are your elementary school years. Um, and this is when children gain logical thought. Now they question everything you say. And it's called concrete because children perform basic concrete mathematical tasks at this point. Um, the mental milestone here is conservation, recognizing that if the form changes, the amount stays the same. Uh, the next stage at your, uh, when you go through puberty around middle school or into high school, uh, formal operational. And this is when uh, individuals learn to think abstractly or hypothetically. Vygotsky was also a developmental psychologist looking at children. Um, he believed that sometimes children can do things mentally um, at an earlier age if they are in an environment where someone is working with them and encourages learning. So he called that the zone of proximal development. Mary Ainsworth looked at two different types of attachment. Um, first of all, secure attachment. These are children who have minimal separation anxiety because their needs um, have been met. Their emotional needs have been met. Um, so they're more explorative, more confident and relaxed. Uh, caregivers who do not um, provide children with their uh, emotional needs uh, can become stressed and anxious and uh, develop a lot of separation anxiety. Uh, to test what type of attachment a child has, uh, Mary Ainsworth used the strange situation. So that was a doctor's office waiting room that was filled with toys. A mother and the child go in and then a stranger walks in. Children with a secure attachment, um, they feel trusting, they feel secure. So they might separate from the mother and go play with toys or even interact with the stranger. Um, someone with an insecure attachment would just stay with the mother and be very clingy. So this attachment needs to begin immediately after birth. This is called the critical period. And as you know, this is imperative for physical growth, for cognitive development, and also social development. Um, Conrad Lorenz down here on the left, he recognized that some animals uh, that hatch from eggs, such as ducks, uh, will attach themselves to the first thing or person that they see. So when his um, ducks, when they hatched, they saw him first and they followed him around ignoring their mother and this is referred to as imprinting. So Harry Harlow in the 1960s as well as many other psychologists believed that animals do not need that touch and attachment that they just simply need um, their basic needs met such as feeding and they didn't care about that touch and attachment. So this is his experiment where he took young monkeys away from their mother and put them with two surrogate mothers. One was a wire mother 
that did not provide any type of uh, touch or comfort, but that wire mother could feed it. The other mother was a cloth mother that could not feed the monkey. So it was thought before this took place that the monkey would just focus on the wire mother because it could feed them, but it was, he was wrong. Uh, the monkeys spent about 22 hours a day clinging to the cloth mother, craving that attachment, only going to the wire mother to get fed. And we find that monkeys who were raised in uh, this deprivation of attachment, uh, where it impaired them socially later on, they could not interact with other monkeys uh, later on in life. And many of them, when they were able to reproduce, uh, were neglectful of their young or even uh, killed their young offspring. All right, so the next person, Diane Baumrin, uh, she believed that there are three different types of parenting styles and they correlate with self-concept of children. Uh, the first, authoritarian. These are parents who are very strict and demanding and very distrusting. Do as I say and don't ask questions. They have a lot of rules with a lot of consequence if you break those rules. Children in this type of environment um, are excellent students and they usually are very well behaved because the punishment that they'll get at home is very bad. So um, <clears throat> they've never had a chance to take part in the discussion with their parents because they're so strict. So children in this type of setting usually do not have a, a very positive or high self-concept. Um, the permissive parent, permissive parent just wants to be their child's friend. They have no rules and no consequence. Uh, they get their children anything they want. So there's usually um, this sense of entitlement that the child develops, you know, they're always handed everything, they're never told no, so they expect that from the world. Um, so they usually have very high self-concept because, you know, they, they're they always being told how great they are and they have the best stuff, so most people like them and want to hang out with them. Um, however, there can be behavior problems and not do very well in school because there's no expectation at home. All right, the third is the type of parent that we should all strive to be, the authoritative parent, having rules and structure, uh, but allowing the child to engage in developing those rules and the consequence for breaking those rules. So they're very warm and understanding and a lot of uh, discussion between the parent and the child. And Children in this type of environment obviously will have very high self-concept. These are your leaders because they're used to taking part in making decisions. All right, so Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. So Erickson believed that we go through different stages um, as we get older and um, there's different social tasks that we have to accomplish. And if we don't, uh, then that will come back and be like a personality flaw later in life. So first of all, during the infancy stage, trust versus mistrust, this begins at birth. Um, and this is when babies are learning about the world around them, but they're very dependent. Obviously they can't do anything for themselves. So um, if your baby cries and you meet their needs by holding and feeding them and caring for them, then they build trust. Um, if babies are neglected and those needs aren't met right away, they develop mistrust later in life and, and feel very distrusting of others and have difficulty uh, having a good relationship with a significant other. <clears throat> All right, stage two. Um, this is during the toddler years, about 18 months of age until around two or three. So the toddler is developing autonomy. Toddlers are learning how to do things for themselves. So by praising them and you know telling them they're doing a good job, um, 
they will develop that autonomy or self-belief. If you discourage your toddler and scold them, you know, if they're not able to go to the bathroom independently, uh, they may feel very doubtful of their abilities later in life. Um, during the preschool years, uh, children are developing a sense of initiative. They're very curious and want to try new things. So this begins at three and lasts till around five or six. Um, your child is going to focus on doing things independently on their own and has a set of goals that they're striving for. If they feel encouraged to take this initiative um, and, and do things, then they, they feel good about themselves. They have a sense of purpose in their life. If they're criticized and discouraged by caregivers, um, not allowed to take that initiative, then they may feel guilty. Um, and that continues into later in life as well. All right, stage four, um, during the early years, uh, they are developing industry. So this is from about age six to around age 11 or 12. So during this stage, uh, children become aware of they are an individual and they are striving to accomplish uh, certain goals in school and sports and seek praise from people around them. So it's important at this age, if your child uh, you know, brings home something from school, you tell them it's, it, it looks really nice, put it on the fridge, um, and that gives them a sense of industry. Uh, if, if teachers, caregivers, and other peers offer support, and they develop a sense of competence and being productive. If they don't receive positive reinforcement for their accomplishments, then they may feel inferior or incompetent to others, uh, and that persists until later in life as well. During the adolescent years, this is um, identity versus role confusion. During your adolescent years, you're trying to establish your identity, what you want out of life, your goals and expectations, um, what you want to do. And if you cannot figure that out, then you go into role confusion. Um, the young adult, uh, the goal is to find an a lasting relationship of intimacy uh, with a significant other. Um, this stage lasts until around age 40. And if you can't, then you will feel isolated and lonely. The middle adult, so this is <clears throat> around 40 to 65. Uh, they are developing a sense of generativity. Uh, when you feel a sense of care and responsibility, it's called generativity. Uh, so you look out for those around you and feel the need to pass along what you've learned in your life to younger generations. Um, if you don't act as a mentor in some capacity, you may feel bitter and unhappy. So this can lead to restlessness and isolation from your friends, family, and society, which is stagnation. Um, and then late adulthood. So obviously this is after 65. Um, if you are satisfied with your life and you've aged with grace and you feel like you've accomplished uh, most of your goals, you develop that integrity um, and you want to demonstrate what you've learned to others. If you don't feel a sense of accomplishment, um, you may look back on your life and fall into despair and be very bitter and have a lot of, I guess, regret. So Lawrence Kohlberg came up with three stages of moral development. Um, the first stage, pre-conventional. Uh, a young child will follow rules and regulations for selfish reasons. So they will do what they're told to either get a reward or avoid some punishment. During the middle school years, you develop a conventional level of moral development and you understand the reason for rules and you follow the rules to fit in with society. This is what society says I should do. So you follow suit. You don't want to be seen as unusual or different. Uh, some people develop a post-conventional sense of morality where they uh, develop their own ethical guidelines 
their own their own set of moral values. It can be the same as society or it can be different, but it's your own personal belief. Okay, in this slide we look at Kubler and Ross's five stages of dying or death. Um, the first stage, denial. In this stage, someone learning terrible news is unable to process or understand the information and may choose to believe that it's incorrect or somehow mistaken, that a loved one's diagnosis or themselves is a clerical error, or the name they've heard on the news is wrong or uh, that isn't really um, happening to them. Um, this is during this state, it's also characterized by shock and numbness. Someone in denial may feel life no longer makes any sense. Um, the second stage that comes next is anger, uh, typically, but not always following denial. Uh, once the person understands that the news is actually true, um, they become frustrated and angry, often lashing out at um, those around them or uh, being angry and trying to hold someone responsible. You know, asking themselves, why is this happening to me or your loved one? Stage three is a bargaining stage. Uh, seek out reasons to believe uh, that somehow we can avoid our, our fate or grief. Um, the bargaining can be found, um, you know, it's sometimes you know, people in this stage may plead with God or the universe. Uh, you know, I'll do this if you make this all better. What if scenarios come into play? Um, after that bargaining stage is over, a person goes into a stage of depression um, where they have um, deep grief that they're experiencing in which they kind of isolate themselves from others. On um, this stage, people tend to believe these feelings will last forever. <clears throat> Feel like life is absolutely meaningless. Uh, it's a very lonely stage, like I said, where they spend a lot of time away from friends and family and stay by themselves. And then finally, the fifth stage is accepting where we're under, able to understand the reality of what's going on and uh, accept the loss of a loved one or the illness, the, the terminal illness they're being faced with. Doesn't mean that they're okay with it or they won't feel sad, um, but they just, they're more stable and, and have a, a little bit more stability here in this final stage. Um, they may develop a, things, a sense that things will be okay again one day. All right, so with the dissociation theory, this is Ernest Hilgard. Um, this involves hypnosis. So this is the idea that there is a split in our conscious awareness during hypnosis. Um, we channel our thoughts to somewhere else and something else is happening uh, during hypnosis. That's the split or division called dissociation. Um, in order to support his theory of hypnosis, they use the ice water experiment. So somebody who is under hypnosis can keep their hand in uh, ice water for a very long time and not feel any pain, whereas someone who is not hypnotized cannot do that. Um, and some people have undergone surgery uh, without any pain medicine when under hypnosis as well. So Orne and Evans argued against the dissociation theory, believing that people are just acting, that they're not really uh, hypnotized. And they call this the social influence or social role theory. All right, Gestalt. Gestalt, we looked at when we talked about perception. Um, this is the idea that whenever we see something, we take in the whole. You know, you look at this picture on the right and you see a forest scene, two horses and a man. But as you start to focus 
and you keep looking, you start to see faces. So Gestalt, we take in the whole picture and then our mind breaks things down into details. All right, so depth perception, let's see. Ability to recognize depth and distance, so you're judging distance or a depth. Um, <clears throat> animals, once they're born, they can, they have depth perception. You know, they won't walk off a cliff. So the question was, what about humans? When babies can crawl, can they? Do they have depth perception, or would a baby just crawl right off of a cliff? So they developed this test called the visual cliff. So you can see the glass tabletop, and then underneath there's a solid table um, that has a tablecloth on it that drops off. So it appears that the table uh, that the that the, there is a cliff there. So that's the visual cliff. And then they put a caregiver on the other side of the glass table. They try to encourage the child to crawl across the glass table. Um, the results, a majority of the babies would not cross, but some actually did. So most children do develop depth perception when they can crawl, but not all. One psychologist that you want to associate with observational learning is Albert Bandura. He is very well known for his research with children, which he called the Bobo doll experiment. He wanted to see if young children would model aggressive behavior if they observed it. His experiment was conducted in 1961. With the invention of the television, it became widely available to American families in the 1950s. Most households had one TV by 1961. Many programs on the television, such as Westerns, cartoons, etc., had a lot of violence. He was wondering what effect this violence would have on children who were watching. His experiment involved some children watching a woman beat up an inflatable clown called a Bobo doll. Some children watched and some did not. The children who watched the woman beat up the Bobo doll in turn modeled that aggression when they were allowed to have access to the inflatable clown. You can click on the hyperlink to watch this video. One researcher, Paul Ekman, found that we have six uh, universal facial expressions that you would see in all cultures. He traveled around the globe visiting every culture, asking questions, how would you look if something sad happened? For example, a loved one died, or if something really great happened to you, uh, how would you express that on your face? And so he found that we have these six universal expressions which are looking at the top left and moving right. Uh, first of all, A, you see that's joy or happiness. Uh, in the middle there, that is surprise. And then to the right, at uh, the top, C, that is fear. At the bottom, D, that is sadness. And then E, anger. And then F, a lot of people have trouble with that, is disgust. Now, these are universal. They are facial expressions that we are born with. Even blind babies show these six basic expressions. So they're not something that we are observing. Uh, as I said, you are born with these. So when looking at emotion, uh, Carol Izzard in 1977 was the one who identified that we have 10 basic emotions. Um, you may look at the list and say, well, I experience other emotions like love. She believed that all other emotions are just combinations of these 10. So love would be <clears throat> a combination of joy and interest excitement. First of all, the James Longa theory was the first to be proposed. Uh, if you recall, William James was the American psychologist who wrote the first psych textbook and was a professor at Harvard. His partner, Carl Langa, was actually part of his team to come up with this first theory of emotion. So according to the James Longa theory, first of all, 
you experience some stimulus. Then you have a physiological change, and then you experience the emotion. So if you're driving down the road and something darts out in front of you, first of all, your physiological change will occur. Your, start, your heart will start to pound. You have an increase in heart rate, increase in breathing, and then you label this as fear. So another example, if someone comes up and punches you in the arm, you will cry, and then you will feel sad. William James believed that the reason why emotion came after bodily change is because he found that there's certain muscles in the face, and when those muscles change, they trigger an emotion in our body. So he would have students put a pencil in their mouth. You hold a pencil in your mouth, it causes your muscles in your mouth, in your face, to make the shape of a smile. And as you do that, that will start to make you feel happy. So that change in your body will trigger some emotion. So your emotion comes from a bodily change. And this is called facial feedback hypothesis. Walter Cannon and Philip Bard, on the other hand, disagreed with the James Longa theory. So they proposed that the physical change and the emotion happen simultaneously. We experience emotion way too fast, according to this theory, uh, for it to be one preceding the other. So, for example, if you're driving down the road and something darts out in front of you, you'll have a physical change, your sympathetic nervous system will increase, your heart will race, etc., and you'll experience fear at the same time. Or if somebody punches you, you will cry and you'll feel sad simultaneously. After that, William Schachter came along and he came up with what's called the two-factor theory of emotion. He applies cognition. And if you recall, the definition of emotion actually includes cognition or being cognitively aware. So he believed you have to assess the situation in order to know what emotion you are experiencing. So, for example, if you're driving a car, something darts out in front of you, you'll have a physical change and you'll think, oh no, and then you'll experience that fear. So, cognition precedes that emotion. Um, and I gave the example, let's say you see your, your boyfriend or girlfriend off talking to someone else secreti secretively in the corner. Immediately, your heart starts to pound, and you start to perspire, and you think, oh, what are they doing? And then you feel jealousy. So he brings in cognition. Sometimes this is called the Schachter-Singer theory also because his assistant, Jerome Singer, helped him with this. So the last concept that we need to look at is memory construction. Uh, most of the memories that we have are not actually what occurred. Sometimes our emotions or our level of attention during the event can influence how we remember it. This is why we can all witness the same event, but we recall it very differently. Sometimes somebody can even suggest something about an event that you've occurred or witnessed, and you start to incorporate that information into your memories. Your memories change. They're always changing. Memories are malleable. So, um, like I said, just a suggestion, or sometimes think of you're telling a story to someone, and they're really not paying attention, so you add some juicy details to it. And then you tell it over and over and over again. And then to you, it seems like it's a part of the memory and you forget that you've added it because just talking about it distorted your memory and changed it and created a new one. Uh, my grandmother used to tell me a story over and over and over again about when I was three, this dog chased me and I threw my lunch at it. And I guess I was coming home you know, from preschool or something. Anyway, I have a very vivid memory of that in my mind. But that's impossible because as we talked about neuroscience, due to infantile amnesia 
and the inability for information to get into your storage facilities prior to the age of four and a half, I could not have created that memory. So I created a memory just by hearing that story that my grandmother told over and over again. Now, Elizabeth Loftus, I have her name written there. She is the leading researcher in memory construction. Uh, she's a cognitive psychology professor. And in her classes, another experiment she did, she staged a theft. So in the middle of her class, somebody ran into the lecture hall, grabbed her pocketbook, and ran out. And of course, the students think this is real. And she says to the class, oh my goodness, I don't remember anything about the perpetrator except for his odd-shaped nose. So then security, uh, campus security came in to question all of the students about what he was wearing, what he looked like, and their descriptions were all over the place. Some said he was short, some said he was tall, some said he had long hair, some said he had curly hair. Everybody had a different idea of what he was wearing, but since she put that into their memory about his nose, all of them made a comment about his nose. Okay, so their memory of the event actually changed or was created based on or constructed based on her suggestion. So most of the memories that we actually have, as I said before, are not actually what happened. You can go on a vacation with your family and you all experience the same thing, and you remember certain things that made you happy or made you miserable, and they'll remember other things. And, and so our memories of events are always different and changing. If someone in your family, if you had a memory about something that happened on vacation that you weren't really happy with, and then someone told you a detail that was positive, that can change your memory altogether. So memories never stay the same. They're always changing. So another experiment that Loftus did here is that she asked her students to watch a video of an accident. So everybody in the class watched this video. After the video was over, she gave some students, we call group A, some questions, and group B was given separate questions. So let's take a look at what those are. So group A students who watched the car crash video were asked how fast were cars going when they hit each other. The majority of these students rated it between 10 to 15 miles per hour because of the inference of the word hit. Group B students were asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. Just by seeing the word smashed in your mind means it was a higher rate of speed. And in fact, most of these students wrote down 35 to 40 miles per hour, a very significant difference. So just by having two different adjectives, their answers were very, very different about the same occurrence. The fourth layer theory was proposed by humanist Abraham Maslow and he calls his theory hierarchy of needs. He believed that we are motivated at different levels. And we have to have our physiological or biological needs met first, and then we can progress to more external needs. So first of all, the physiological needs at the bottom must be met before you can think about or focus or be motivated to do anything else. You have to have food and water. And if you've ever been hung went hungry, for like half a day, you cannot focus on anything else if you're hungry. You have to have these needs met. So if your physiological needs are met, you have food and water, then one can focus on safety and security needs. Imagine if you lived in an environment that you feared for your safety. Again, you could not progress or be motivated to satisfy more external needs. So your physiological needs are met, you feel safe in your environment, the next level you move into is trying to find a friendship or a significant other, trying to find love and belongingness with others. If that need is finally met, that's the third, then we can start focusing on ourself, trying to improve our self-esteem and our self-image, self-concept, and accept ourselves. 
So if those four needs are met, then we can progress to the highest level, which is called self-actualization. And that is fulfilling all of your needs, meeting your fullest potential, reaching your goals and dreams that you have set for yourself. And Maslow realized that not everyone will accomplish this. Sometimes people fall short in the dreams that they had for themselves, finding it maybe too challenging or doubting themselves for some reason. The first biological factor that was studied was stomach contractions. Walter Cannon and A.L. Washburn got together and decided that they were going to look and see if people felt hungry due to the stomach lining contracting. So in the early 1900s, they had a volunteer swallow a balloon which was then inflated. That balloon was then connected to a panel that recorded when their stomach contracted. The subject was also supposed to record when they felt hungry. And as a result of this study, they found that the subjects were reporting feeling hungry at the same time the stomach was contracting. So they concluded, we feel hungry because our stomach contracts. So Masters and Johnson <clears throat> were the ones who identified the four stages um, that we go through physically uh, when having sexual intercourse. So that was in the 1960s where they <clears throat> had sex workers come in and observe them during intercourse. So <clears throat> when we looked at sexual orientation, um, there was all kinds of biological explanations for how sexual uh, orientation is determined. So Simon LeBay did a study looking at uh, cells in the hypothalamus. He found that uh, homosexual males had much smaller cells in the hypothalamus than a heterosexual male. Also, he recognized that <clears throat> both females and homosexual males, um, when exposed to male pheromones or sweat, have an increase in activity in the hypothalamus, but heterosexual males do not. The first theory is called the social learning theory. According to the theory, we learn how to act masculine or feminine through observing our caregivers or older adults. Young boys will imitate their fathers, young girls will observe and imitate their mothers, but also through reinforcement or punishment, kind of like operant conditioning here. So, for example, if you have a young boy named Sammy, he watches his dad play baseball, he imitates that behavior, so he's rewarded because that's a masculine behavior. However, if Sammy watches his mom put on makeup and then he copies that behavior, then he is punished or scolded until that is not appropriate masculine behavior. Let's say you have a little boy and or a little girl and she's out riding a bike, three years old, she falls down, she scrapes her knee and starts crying. You immediately scoop her up and start to coddle her and you kind of praise that emotional behavior. Whereas your son does the same thing, falls down, starts to cry, you say, brush it off, take it like a man. You know, trying to scold that behavior, associate, associating it as a feminine behavior. So here, again, we learn how to act masculine or feminine by observing older adults or caregivers, and also through being rewarded for appropriate masculine or feminine behavior and punished for the opposite. All right, Noam Chomsky believed that we have an inborn ability to understand grammar and language. Um, he believed that we learn so many new words um, daily that it happens too fast to be something that's observed like skin or thought. He believed we have a language acquisition device in the brain that allows us to do this. In the early 1900s, France passed a law making it mandatory for all children to attend public school. Prior to that law, only wealthy children could go to school. Many families 
needed their children to work in the factories, fields, or businesses to make ends meet. Whenever the French passed this law, it was clear that children who had not attended school may not be very successful. For example, if a child is 10 and has been working since they were 5, and they were placed with other students who are the same age, but have been in school for the past five years, they will not be on the same level and be set up for failure. So Benet and his assistant, uh, Simon, <coughs> Theodore Simon, created a test to help identify students who had special needs. Eleven years after the creation of Benet's intelligence test, the Americans came up with their own revision. This test was created in 1916 by Lewis Terman, a professor at Stanford University. At this time, it was believed that intelligence was inherited and that people who were uneducated were more prone to criminal activity. This test, sadly, was not designed to help children with special needs like France. One use for this test was for immigration control. Americans didn't want people to enter the country who were uneducated and did not have their own language or customs. Those who came in through Ellis Island on the East Coast or Angel Island on the West Coast were given this test without a translator. So obviously, those who didn't speak the language or who were illiterate failed and were sent back. Another program this test was used for is a program called Eugenics that was created by Henry Goodard. Again, believing that uneducated people commit more crime and pass that on to their offspring, one way to stop crime would be to identify people who fell into this category and stop them from reproducing. Most states adopted a eugenics program, which began in the 1920s and in some states, like North Carolina, continued into the 1970s. Overall, approximately 64,000 Americans, mostly young women, who were deemed feeble-minded, were sterilized. Many of them did not even understand what procedure they had had when they left the hospital. You don't find this in your history books. It's kind of a dirty little secret. Mentally ill were also among those who were sterilized. It was very well known at the time and widely accepted. A national poll in the 1930s reported 64% of the American population believed it was a good program. The Nazi party took great interest before World War II. They admired our eugenics program and used many of our ideas in their atrocities against the Jews. If you are interested in this topic, there's a great BBC documentary, which I've listed the link to below. The score of an intelligence test was created by a man named William Stern. He derived what's called the intelligence quotient, which is a person's mental age divided by their chronological age, and then multiply that by 100 to get rid of the decimal. The first theory was proposed by Spearman. Spearman believed in what he called generalized intelligence, or factor analysis. If you are smart in one area, or do well in one area, you should do well in all areas. Recognizing that people who generally do well in one subject tend to score high in other subjects as well. Howard Gardner disagreed with Spearman. He believed that we have different levels of intelligence, and you can excel in one area and not another. He believed that people didn't have just one basic general intelligence. You don't have to do well in everything. He used a condition called savant syndrome to support his theory of multiple intelligence. Someone with savant usually excels in one area, uh, generally computation, or it could be drawing or music, something artsy, but yet they lack in common sense or practical knowledge. The most widely accepted intelligence theory is 
the triarchic theory, try for three. Uh, Robert Sternberg believed we have not eight different levels, but three different levels of intelligence. First of all, they are number one, analytical. This would be your academic knowledge. Creative, uh, this would be being able to problem solve and also including all of the arts. And practical knowledge, this is common sense. You know, a lot of time people will excel in academic knowledge but lack in the uh, practical or common sense knowledge. Today, the most widely used intelligence test is not the Stanford Binet. However, it's called the Weschler's Adult Intelligence Scale, otherwise known as the WACE. It was created by David Weschler. This test has two subgroups or subtests. One is verbal, which is similar to questions that you would be familiar with on an intelligence test that deal with uh, verbal comprehension, basic arithmetic arithmetic, reasoning, vocabulary, comprehension, and general information. But it also has another part to it, which is nonverbal, called performance. This would be like block assembly, pattern formation, picture arrangement, picture completion. A researcher, James R. Flynn, recognized in 1984 that ever since the advent of intelligence test scores have continued to rise. They call this the Flynn effect, named after him. We've discussed the psychoanalytic perspective before, and you've already learned that Sigmund Freud is the one who came up with this perspective. He believed that we act a certain way, or our personality is developed through unconscious thoughts, so thoughts that we are unaware of, or early childhood experiences. So Freud believed that our personality is formed as we go through stages or phases. We transition through these during childhood. He called these psychosexual stages. He believed we have some sexual tension that can cause conflict at each stage. And if we cannot get through them successfully, it can cause problems which he referred to as a fixation. If these aren't resolved, they could cause <clears throat> some flaw in our character later in life. The first stage is the oral stage from birth to 18 months. At this stage, a child is focused on the mouth, sucking, biting, and chewing. So here, if these demands are not met, like a child is not fed in a timely manner when they're hungry or they're fed too frequently, that can lead to an oral fixation. In other words, a person may have issues or fixations involving the mouth when they get older, such as overeating, smoking, biting their nails, or being sarcastic. The second stage is called the anal stage, which lasts from 18 to 13 months. Here, the focus is on the bowel and the bladder. Potty training is very important during the toddler years. They are going to gain control over their bodies. If they are scolded for accidents and pushed by very demanding parents and cannot take control of their bowel and bladder on their own, this can lead to what Freud called an oral fixation. So that would cause a person to be very neat and orderly and precise later in life. On the other extreme, if a child is not encouraged and very delayed in potty training, that can lead to what he called anal expulsion, causing a person to be very messy and disorganized. The third stage takes place in the preschool years, and Freud calls this the phallic stage. At this stage, many children discover their genitals and recognize that they are different from the opposite gender. This is Freud's most controversial subject, but at this stage, he believed children develop a sexual desire or incestuous feelings for the parent of the opposite sex. This is called the Oedipus complex for boys. So boys desire their mothers and develop a rivalry or competition or jealousy for the father. For the girl, this is called the Electra crisis, so a girl will have feelings of rivalry 
in competition with the mother and desires for her father. Although Freud used the term sexual desires, it is obvious that preschoolers do not understand sex the way we do. Therefore, the sexual desire is basically a desire to gain attention from the opposite sex parent. By the end of this stage, a child will transition and start to identify back with the same sex parent. If that doesn't happen, the fixation can cause immaturity and inability to form healthy relationships later in life. The fourth stage is called the latency stage, and this takes place during your elementary school years. Here, Freud believed that sexual tension is dormant. We don't have any conflict with sexual feelings. And during this stage, we start to identify more with the same sex gender. So your little girls out on the playground, if you've ever been to an elementary school, will be playing with other little girls, and little boys are playing with other little boys, and the opposite sex has cooties. And this is like a training ground for um, forming relationships with your same-sex peers and interacting appropriately. So the last stage of Freud's psychosexual stages we call the genital stage. It is a time of adolescent sexual experimentation, the successful resolution of which is settling down in a loving one-to-one -one relationship with another person in our 20s. Sexual instincts uh, are, is directed to heterosexual pleasure rather than self-pleasure, like in the phallic stage. For Freud, the proper outlet of the sexual instinct in adults was through heterosexual intercourse. Fixation and conflict may prevent this with the consequence that sexual perversion may develop. For example, fixation at the oral stage may result in a person gaining sexual pleasure from kissing uh, rather than intercourse. Uh, the Rorschach inkblot test is one of the techniques used by psychoanalysts where you look at different ink blots created by Herman Rorschach and you pretty much just say what you see in the ink blot. And according to your answer, uh, the therapist would analyze you and discover things about you that you're unaware of, unconscious things that you're experiencing. So these are three neo-Freudians who kind of built off, off of Freud's theory. Um, Alfred Adler believed that the birth order makes a difference in your personality and also we should focus on social factors and not sexual ones like Freud said. Um, Karen Horney, uh, she fought against um, Freud's penis envy and other masculine biases. Uh, Carl Ung, he believed that we share certain ideas worldwide with others like what uh, your idea of a hero would be and that is what he called collective unconscious. As you recall, your two humanists are Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. So here we're looking at Carl Rogers. He believed in what he called client-centered therapy. So the patient is the center of the therapy session. And this involves active listening. So you just simply, like free association, sit and listen to what the client is saying or patient is saying. But instead of being judgmental and analytical and telling the person what's secretly, hiddenly going on with them, driving their behavior, you just simply rephrase what the person is saying and echo it back to them. And this will make them aware of what their issue is. So I want to ask you to pause the video for a minute and watch a clip from Everyone, Everybody Loves Raymond, which is active listening really well. This is the trait perspective on personality. Uh, Gordon Allport came up with this perspective. Uh, according to this perspective, our personality is uh, something that's that we're born with. It's biological or genetic. And you would take certain personality inventory tests that would tell you what type of personality you have, like the big five. 
uh, this perspective looks at personality as well. This is the social cognitive perspective. So according to Albert Bandura, um, our personality can change depending on the social situation that we're in. It is how we cognitively think or appraise a social setting and then we react. Um, also reciprocal determinism, the way we treat others will determine how they reciprocate or treat us. So if we're nice to someone, then they'll treat us nice. So you're going to see the first transformation from these barbaric prisons into a more modern type <clears throat> of mental institution take place in France in the early 1800s. Uh, the man who advocated for this change was a man named Philippe Pinel. He went around and visited uh, these barbaric mental institutions and wrote about the conditions to raise awareness and, and pleaded for a change. Um, he believed that instead of locking them up and putting them in cages, that people could actually be diagnosed. You could talk to them, you could treat them, and maybe even cure them. And this was known as the medical model. Not just locking them away, but let's talk to them and, and try to figure out what caused this and how we can change that behavior. Here in the United States, that doesn't take place until the latter part of the 1800s after the Civil War. And Dorothea Dix is going to be the person in the United States who advocates for that change. Um, Dr. Rosenhan in 1973, he was a psychiatrist, and he believed that conditions in mental institutions were still unsatisfactory and that uh, people were uh, stigma, uh, given a stigma when they went into uh, mental institutions. And once you got in, it was very difficult to get out. And they were forever seen as mentally ill and really inhuman also. So he and a few of his colleagues were pseudo patients. They started to say to other uh, physicians, they were hearing voices and they were admitted to mental hospitals with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And after being admitted, they said that they weren't hearing the voices anymore and that they were fine, but they found it was very difficult to get out. We had psychoanalysis, humanistic, and behavioral. And the fourth one is cognitive therapy. A cognitive therapist is looking at someone's thought process. The way a person assesses a situation or thinks about their surroundings can influence the way they behave. So a cognitive therapist attempts to change someone's thoughts. If you can ultimately change their thought process, then ultimately that will change the behavior. So the example up here, someone loses their job, they think they're worthless, that leads to depression. You have to shift their way of thinking off of themselves and on to someone else. Uh, this is used for a CD. In, in many cases, explaining to someone that they're not going to get sick and die from touching a germ and, you know, what's the probability of that. And we need to be exposed to certain bacteria in order to build up resistance. So those are the four different types of psychotherapy. Again, psychoanalysis, humanism, behavioral, and cognitive. And I should mention also Aaron Beck is the one who came up with cognitive therapy. So we have these certain attitudes or beliefs on how people should act in a particular role. And oftentimes, whenever we are placed in a particular role, we try to meet those expectations. Philip Zimbardo conducted a what he called a prison study in 1972. Um, here, he um, randomly assigned student uh, volunteers to act as either prisoners or guards. He did this in the basement of Stanford University. In less than a week, the students became so absorbed in their role playing that the roles they played actually became a part of them. The guards became very abusive uh, and had a, 
a superior attitude towards the prisoners. And when the prisoners, kind of what they thought was rebelling, the guards believed it to be rebelling, or just disagreed and didn't want to do the things the guards were asking of them, the guards became very oppressive and the study had to be shut down way before uh, the two weeks that they intended. Um, so Zimbardo really understood here that through this study, play, placing good people or average people in a role where one has authority over another, sometimes that can lead to an oppressive and, and demeaning uh, behavior. Again, in the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, we saw that as well. Uh, take a minute and check out the link to watch a video clip about this prison study. One researcher that studied conformity and was concerned with how strong is our desire to fit in with others, that normative social influence, was a man named Solomon Ash. He performed what we refer to as the line study. So he had a group of subjects, uh, five men who were all actors in his experiment. And they're all sitting around a table, and they have one volunteer that comes in who has no idea what's going on. Uh, this volunteer uh, that's participating in this experiment uh, was told that he was actually participating in an experiment on perception. Okay, so it's actually not on perception. It was about conformity, but the volunteer didn't know. Anyway, the gentlemen who are sitting around the table, they start with the actors who are part of the experiment, and they show them a slide, which you can see up here on the left. First of all, they're shown a standard line, and then they're, throw, they're shown the three comparison lines, one, two, and three. So the gentlemen are asked, which of the following three comparison lines are most similar to the standard line? So the first couple uh, slides that they're shown, the actors give the correct answer. So they would say, obviously, that's two. Two, two, two. They get around to the volunteer, he says two. But after several slides are shown, the actors go in the opposite direction. When they're shown a slide, they give the wrong answer on purpose. So the first actor would say one. The next one says one. The third one says one. And then when it gets to the unknowing volunteer, Strangely enough, instead of giving the correct answer, even though it's very obvious, they give the wrong answer going along with the group. 67%, so roughly two out of three participants in this study, gave the wrong answer even though they knew it was wrong. When asked why they gave the wrong answer, it was simple. They did not want to go against the group. They didn't want to explain how their answer was different, and it was just easier to conform and go along. So a student of Solomon Ash, his name was Stanley Milgram, he kind of took this idea one step further. He performed an experiment to see if people would actually blindly obey someone in an authoritarian position even if it meant hurting another individual. Milgram wanted to do this study as the Nuremberg trials uh, were raging on, where the Nazi uh, officers were being held for war crimes. He was wondering, are these really evil people, or they, were they just blindly following orders, just obeying what they were told because they felt they had to, uh, being told by someone in an authoritarian position. So, if you look at the diagram below, his study involved a teacher, which you can see sitting at the desk. That's a part of the experiment, an actor. He's supposed to be a teacher in a lab coat, so he's the authoritarian figure. And then the guy at the far left, who looks like he has a wire hooked up to him, that was also an actor, and he's behind a panel. He's hooked up to a uh, panel that administers electric shock. So the volunteer is coming in, and he's supposed to administer electric shock to this participant behind the panel every time he gets a question wrong. 
So this unknowing volunteer thinks that he's taking part in an experiment on memory. And by administering electric shock, when a wrong answer is given, it will improve his memory. Now, with each incorrect answer, the volunteer is supposed to increase the voltage. The voltage on the panel went all the way up to 450 volts. Would have this would have clearly killed or severely harmed the individual behind the panel. And despite the fact that the volunteer behind the, or the actor behind the panel was screaming when the electric shock was supposed to be uh, administrated, the volunteers just kept increasing when told to do so by the authoritarian figure in the lab coat. Fortunately, this was just an act and the person was not really receiving electric shock. But the experiment had profound, showed profound effects. The subjects, again, two out of three, went all the way to a lethal dosage. So this showed that some people can just blindly conform and be obedient to someone who they think is in charge of them, even if it means harming another individual. We're going to look at three different theories uh, behind the cause of prejudice, what causes us to develop this prejudice or negative attitude. Um, the first theory is the in-group bias theory. This is when we tend to favor uh, people who are in our group and share something in common with us. So we start to develop this us versus them mentality. And then we start to feel negative towards people who aren't in our group. Sometimes this can build up between different schools who have a rivalry. You attend one school and you feel like you're superior, so you start to feel negative towards others who don't go to your school and go to your rival high school. This in-group theory and this us versus them mentality was demonstrated very well um, in an experiment that a third grade teacher in Riceville, Iowa named Jane Elliott did. We're going to call this the brown-eyed, blue-eyed experiment. After the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Mrs. Elliott wanted to try and explain to her children in her class what discrimination was all about. However, being in an all-white uh, Protestant area, uh, she didn't know how to get this idea of discrimination and prejudice across to them and, and make them experience it. So she decided that she would come in one day and she stated that all of the blue-eyed kids were superior to the brown-eyed kids. And the blue-eyed kids would get privileges throughout the day. They could get extra if at lunch, they could drink from the water fountain first, they got extra time at recess, etc. The brown-eyed kids, they were inferior and they had to wear collars to identify them. And the superior blue-eyed kids were not allowed to hang out with the brown-eyed kids. And just within a little over an hour, the blue-eyed kids started discriminating against the brown-eyed students, you know, developing that us versus them mentality. I want you to pause the video for a minute and watch a clip from uh, Jane Elliott's brown-eyed, blue-eyed experiment. So once again, the light waves will pass through the pupil and be cast onto the lens. The lens will change shape in order to cast that image onto the inner surface of the eye, the retina. Within the retina, the photoreceptors, the rods and the cones, will transfer the energy stimulus, the light waves, into a neural impulse in the process known as transduction. The optic nerve will then pick up that neural impulse and carry it up to the brain. As we've learned in previous lessons, all sensory input, except for smell, will then stop at the thalamus. The thalamus will send those impulses where they will need to go to be interpreted. With vision, those impulses will be sent to the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe contains what we call feature detectors. So these special detectors will detect shape, form, color, 
all at the same time, which is a process known as parallel processing. So this is Ben Morf's linguistic determinism. This is the fact that language determines the way we think. We do not think about things that we do not have words for. 